This is ENP Reports from Editor and Publisher Magazine, the authoritative voice of news media since 1884, serving newspapers, broadcasts, digital, and all multimedia news publishing. And greetings once again, Mike Blinder, publisher of ENP Magazine. We always do housekeeping first. If you're listening to this broadcast on your favorite podcast channel, please follow us. Watching us on our YouTube channel, there's a subscribe button below me. There is a bell to the right. If you hit the bell, you'll get an update each and every time we upload a new episode of ENP Reports. Um, I am just so happy to be here with uh, a, a, a great guest, um, Delano Massey. Um, Delano, you don't look, you're, well, for those of us who are watching on YouTube, you don't look your pedigree, because you go way back. I, I've been checking you out. You started in Ohio, is that correct? Yeah. And, and you were doing it just, you were just, you must have had ink in your veins, because you were like doing reporting in, in your youth, correct? Um, I, I did. I, I did for a little bit. Um, you know, I, I did some prep sports and covered covered uh, prep sports for my local newspaper. Um, it was actually probably, I guess, the first journalism job that I had. And it didn't last very long because I actually ended up getting fired. I wasn't very good at covering stuff. <laughs> There's a secret I didn't see on your LinkedIn profile, sir. Did you? Like we've, all, we've all had our ups and downs, but since then, <laughs> you've you 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 did a lot of pretty cool stuff. You um you know obviously the the Akron Beacon Journal a lot of us are familiar with. Um, but then you wound up at McClatchy, the Lexington Herald Leader, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, I started out my career in Belleville, Illinois, and at the time it was the Knight Ritter Company. Um, and I, I wanted, you know, I had an internship at the Beacon Journal, and I, read, I really would have enjoyed having a job straight out of school at the Beacon, but that was not something that was presented to me. Um, but I did have an opportunity to go to Belleville, Illinois to be a general assignment reporter. Um, but it quickly changed to me becoming a night cops reporter because the person who had been covering night cops had been there for a while. So it was also an opportunity for my for me to cut my teeth. And I had at that point only covered features. So this was how I learned how to become like a, a good cops reporter, right? Working in East St. Louis and and covering, um, you know, a, a variety of things in, in Belleville and in the surrounding uh, area. Uh, what I love about your, your background is you're kind of like me. I entered this industry on the digital side. I was one of the started one of the first online newspapers in the United States. You were a digital director before being a digital director was cool, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, like, go look, ahead. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I've look. I've, I've had a, a lot of different experiences in my career, and in in 2008 when the recession hit. Um, you know, I've been laid off basically twice. I got laid off at the Beacon Journal, and then I went back to the Herald Leader to start my career as um, an editor. And then I was the least tenured editor, so I ended up getting laid off again. Um, so at that particular time, I did go back and I ended up becoming like the Metro editor. But then I thought more intentionally about the things that I wanted to do. And I felt like the industry was quickly changing and video was starting to become far more popular. So I sort of immersed myself in that as well and wanted to be more intentional about the work that I was doing and then um you know eventually made the switch from newspapers to television right that, you know. but, 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 but as a, on the digital side in a way you're on the digital yeah because is, at the, yeah at the time look t t television was just posting their scripts on their website they didn't right. really know how to um to actually write a web story and they didn't have like any kind of process for it so what ended up happening is they asked me to basically pioneer that and help them figure it out. And at the time, I was the first executive producer that was focused on digital. So now it's like a common job. <laughs> but when I did it, I was the first and only at Gray. Uh, just like me back in the old days, trying to figure it out as we went. But we, we want to talk to you about your time at CNN. We want to talk to you now about your new gig starting in April as the managing editor of Axios Local. And we want to talk to you about diversity in the industry as well. We'll get all to that on the backside of this message. This episode of ENP Reports is sponsored by IQ Audience Plus by Town News. Consumer revenue has never been more important. Digital leaders at media organizations worldwide are asking the same question. How do we accelerate the growth of consumer revenue? 
Traditional one-size-fits-all paywalls aren't the answer. They're blunt instruments that treat all visitors the same way, costing you money. IQ Audience Plus by Town News is a smart, dynamic metering solution that empowers you to maximize revenue by identifying key audiences, seeding engagement, and growing membership and subscriptions. Ready to supercharge your consumer revenue, grow engagement, and bolster your advertising income? Visit townnews.com backslash EP today to learn more about IQ Audience Plus by Town News. Delano, um, first, let's talk about your time at CNN, if you don't mind, because okay. I, I was I was diving into some articles about you, some of the stuff back in, in those days. You were the supervising producer of two separate initiatives at CNN, both crime and justice, but also race and equity. Was that simultaneous? Did you move from one to the other? How did you do both at once? What was going on? <laughs> um, I did. I started out at CNN. Um, they actually they, they climbed into my DMs and they they asked if I would be interested in doing um, the justice job. So my my initial start at CNN was actually in the D.C. Bureau. And I went to D.C. to help lead the justice team, which covered the Department of Justice, um, District Court, Immigration, Supreme Court. Yeah. And um, that was my introduction into CNN. And I mean, it it. it there was a lot of breaking news that happened quickly. And, and then, you know, we, in the middle of all of this, we ended up having a pandemic. And, right. um, and so then my focus shifted from, you know, looking at like the department of justice to dealing with FEMA and, and the supplies chain, the supply chain and trying to figure out like what was going on with this pandemic. And then um, in the summer of 2020 uh, you know, there was racial unrest. And, and I think up to that point, like, I've always ended up covering race to some degree throughout my entire career, because a lot of cases, I was the only person of color who was either sitting at the table or actually in a position with a notebook. So um, being at CNN and having had like at least, you know, over a decade or two of covering this, um, the topic, like it, it really seemed like a moment where they needed to do a little bit more. And it wasn't that the coverage that, that that we were doing was inadequate. It was like we needed some additional context and we needed to um, to do a better job of educating our viewers and our readers. So um, I actually was on a call as most people were dealing with some sort of a reckoning in the news industry. So was CNN and ended up on a town hall with Jeff Zucker. And we started talking about like the the coverage and the coverage priorities and what we could do to do a better job. And so I proposed us creating a race team and having just been at um, the Associated Press and, and actually one of the leaders on the race and ethnicity team there, it made a lot of sense to tap into CNN's network across the country and figure out a better plan and a path for the race coverage and actually coordinate it instead of it just kind of happening like sort of piecemeal, right? To actually you know, be more intentional about that coverage. So I launched the, the team because basically Zucker gave me the ball and we ran with it. Um, you know, figured out who we could hire for the team and what that would look like, and then had to figure out the workflow to integrate it in the CNN system. So I would like to tell you that, no, I just focused on the one job, but I actually had both jobs for a, about a year. I was juggling both. So we were in the middle of a, a racial reckoning and I was dealing with that. Um, and then Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And so I was also dealing with that. I mean, it, it went straight into an election that was very really contested and there were lawsuits and then ended up like helping to lead the legal coverage. So uh, <laughs> an experience. <laughs> and you and you stayed sane through the whole process, obviously, because you're, you're. But this is you're, we're discussing CNN's commitment, and I'm. And, you know, it must have been amazing to be on that panel with uh, with Jeff Zucker um, to race and equity coverage. But what about the culture? I mean, you, if you don't mind me asking, at the time, would you have said CNN had a a good DEI environment, um, or were you also coaching and helping on that side as well? Um, look, they they have. Warner has done a pretty good job of trying to make diversity a priority, and, and it has been, and they have people who are leaders in that regard. And I absolutely, especially after um, launching the team, uh, ended up speaking more internally and externally about uh, race and, and diversity and equity and inclusion issues. Like it, it, it is something that even as, as, as large of a company as CNN, like there are always going to be blind spots. And, and that's in any newsroom. Like CNN is a gigantic television station. And the things that happen in a smaller newsroom happen in a larger one, too. You just, you know, you try to figure out your your path and, and how to have uh, and, and have intelligent conversations about this that don't actually end up, you know, becoming explosive. It, you know, we've had so many different people discuss DEI on so many different levels in this platform. 
um, including people from public broadcasting, some of the top newspaper brands in the world. And what you hear that that seems to sometimes be a common thread, and maybe you agree or disagree, that without the feeling of inclusion in a newsroom, you can be as diverse as you want to be. You can hire headhunters. You can find the talent, but will they stay? So in my humble, if I may ask you, sir, um, as, as now a very successful journalist of color who's come up through the last two decades in this industry, what advice would you give, if I may be so bold, I don't know if you want to answer this, to someone who's running a mid-market, I mean, whether it's television, radio, or you know, print, or online-only environment, how do you how do you find that perfect environment where someone feels included? Because am I correct? Because if you don't feel that inclusion uh, and, and a part of the, of the business, you may not stay. Correct. Is, do I have that yeah. right? This is, this is, this has always been a problem. This isn't something that's new. Um, like I said, when I got into the industry around 2008, like when I think about the recession, many of my friends who actually started whenever I got into the industry, they're not here anymore. They're not doing this. They are, lawyers, they're um, doing public relations, or they right. started their own businesses. They, yeah. they they left. And the main reason or among the reasons that they left is because, you know, the way that contracts, union contracts, especially were structured, the last person hired usually was the first fired, right? So the people who had the least amount of seniority were usually the people that actually were sent packing. So if that's the case, and you never actually replenished your ranks, then you're never actually going to um, have, you're not gonna, you're not gonna achieve diversity. And how do you actually give people a voice even in the newsroom? Well, you have to open things up. Like what tends to happen is you have a person who is in a leadership role that makes most of the decisions for a newsroom. And that person is only using their lens. Like my lens is as a black man who grew up in the Midwest, but my experience is not your experience. And so how I'm very limited by like the groups that I am with and the groups that you are with, they're probably not the same at all. Like the friends that I have are probably not the same friends that you have. And if I'm thinking about that in a newsroom and how that plays out, you know, I actually would try to listen more to the people who don't necessarily necessarily look like me because their lived experience is actually going to be more distinctive and they, they're going to have a completely different approach to journalism than I am. How do you feel about taking a brand like CNN? And this is your personal opinion. I know you're not sitting up most probably in the top offices discussing brand identity. And uh, But like, for example, when we were discussing public broadcasting on this very program just a few weeks ago, um, uh, the perception of the brand is white. The perception of the brand is affluent. Um, it's not, I mean, can, in your opinion, does CNN have a brand that penetrates uh, all uh, demographies, all socioeconomic environments, or do you think it needs a little bit more polishing? And if you don't want to answer that question, that's fine with me. Uh, you, you, you might not know me well. I, I appreciate candor. Um, no, <laughs> okay, I, I honestly, I don't think that there is a newsroom that has, has like, perfected diversity or inclusion. Like, I think that everyone has like room to grow and anyone that is, is, is really saying like that they have achieved this, this as like one of the things that they, that, that, that they have perfected. It's probably not true. I mean, I am now at a place that does embrace diversity probably in some ways more, more than what I have seen in, in my career, because the conversation starts at the very beginning. And even like now, as we're building our newsroom, we're having conversations on the very front end of this, right? We're actually talking about how do we have like, you know, a newsroom that is inclusive. How do we bring other people's lived experience into the equation and, and then use that to actually make our news coverage better, right? We're trying to elevate our coverage. Well, this is a conversation that is happening like on, 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 the, on the appropriate level where you're actually hiring people. And so we have an opportunity, especially with Axios Local to do that. Mm -hmm. And so Axios actually is a company that as, as of now, they're 38% um, people of color, 61% female, and the executive team is 35%, you know, people of color, 62% female. So it can happen, but it has to actually be a priority. And if a news organization doesn't make it a priority and they don't see the need, then it's not going to happen. Well, I, you, you know, I was going to say, Vanna, thanks for, for flipping that letter for me, because I was about to move into Axios. You, you, you just recently left in the last few months a really influential position at CNN. Did they come to you? Did you go to Axios? Do you not? Why the switch? Why did you jump ship to Axios? Um, it, you know, the, I, what I, where I am right now in, in my career, um, well, there are a couple of things that, that appeal to me about Axios. One, 
um, I very much believe in the local brand and I wanted to be at a place where I could make an impact and not necessarily have to, you know, it can be hard to move a battleship, as we were saying, in an industry. And if we were in a really large newsroom and, and especially if you're at a legacy brand, uh, it is very hard to get them to to sort of see where they could change their coverage priorities. But being at a place where you get to help shape the coverage priorities, well, that's much different. But I also think that um, the larger news organizations organizations, they have a tendency to, they don't spend a whole lot of time in these communities. Like something could happen. You could have a shooting in like Uvalde or something, and then they'll, they'll come in for a little bit, but then there isn't really a whole lot of like, there, there's not, there's a lot of nuance that's there, right? You don't spend a lot of time talking to the people who are part of the community, the fabric of the community. You don't know like what has been happening, what the relationship has been like for people who are in the community and especially for people of color. So if you're actually in a local market, you actually have a better shot at, at getting to know the people who are actually part of your community. And especially if you're a reporter who is actually entrenched in that community, you're rooted in the community, you're from there, um, you've been covering it, you have a better handle on, you know, the the, the heartbeat of the, the community that you're, you're actually serving. And I think that that's the best approach to journalism anyway. So having an opportunity to do that, and also to create something that has not been done, that is the reason that I'm at Axios is because it's an opportunity to establish something that really hasn't been done yet. I don't know if you've heard of Ken Doctor, who came out of Neiman, who wrote the, a book called Newsonomics in the, and about 12 years ago. He, he started a brand new online-only news outlet with what, what you just said. And I said, but Ken, you came from legacy media. Why didn't you embed your philosophies in an existing brand? And he said, it has to be new. The culture is kind of, I mean, I'm not, I'm not agreeing 100% with you because I'm hoping to God that some of these legacy brands have another, like, you know, Disney survived many different shifts. I'm just hoping yeah. these brands will grow. So Axios, let's let's define that to our audience that may never have heard of it. I was an early fan. I don't know if you were. I mean, I remember when Willie Geist used to bring in, you know, Jim Vandehei, you know, on, on uh, I don't know if you talk way too early. There was always one big thing from Axios. And this is back in 2016, 2017, when it first started. Um, it, the philosophy was, well, how should I put this? Uh, axios, to those that don't know, is a Greek word that means worthy, correct? But it's a whole new thought in news. It's it's bringing news with brevity but importance. Um, it, almost like I remember the best advice I ever had when I was in radio from one of the top minds was find out what they want and give it to them. Would you say that's the Axios philosophy of how you deliver news today? It is. And, and they embrace smart brevity. There's actually a book about it that's that's going to be released soon. And, and, it, and it basically unveils all of the secrets of Axios, right? The secret sauce. But, um, you know, it's 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 what is the news that you need um, in a very short format, right? If, if we're in a, a place right now where people have a very short attention span, then Axios is going to give you the news that you need to know in your respective city or the area of concentration, whether it's like gaming or if it's like, you know, it's politics. Um, and, and in our case, like looking at the local market. So what do you need to know that's happening in your city? And, you know, and, and we'll give it to you in at least maybe four, what we call cards, but maybe it's like four stories. And, I kind of liken it to like an elevator pitch, right? Or getting to, as we would say in the news, like what's the nut grab? What's the point of this story? Um, like, do you need to have the additional fluff that we would traditionally put in a story? Probably not. Do you need 40 inches or 50 inches? I think that 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 is the way that we traditionally have approached things, especially when it has been and how we deliver like the written word. But it, with Axios, it's it's on your phone, right? Like at the end of the day, like everybody is sort of tied to their phone. And if you look at your email, you can basically scan through and we're going to give you the news that you need in about three, three and a half minutes. I attended a conference in Miami. Uh, it was more on the advertising side, but where you half the conference was just exploring Gen Z. And one of the psychologists who spoke said something like, if you don't have them in eight seconds, you don't got them. It's yeah. quick. I mean, you got to get into their brain quick. And I'm saying that as a 65 year old, old man, <laughs> but it's a, it's a whole different world than this in-depth coverage. You keep saying local, local, local. Axios Local is new. Axios yeah. started as a national platform in brevity. Um, then this suddenly, it scared the hell out of this industry when suddenly, just like 6 a.m. City came out and there's a bunch of new um, newsletter startups, Axios Local 
yeah. is just an extension of it. Like down here in Tampa Bay, where I live, um, I get it. Like Ben Montgomery and um, I forget Celine are running the site down here, correct? And you you right. embed two reporters. They work for Axios. How many cities are you in right now? Um, we are actually operating in 24. Well, we will be in 24 by the end of the summer. We have uh, plans to launch probably by uh, next month in Houston, Miami, and San Francisco. Um, and then after that, we'll try to figure out uh, what our strategy is going to be moving forward. But we're not, you know, the, the plan is not to stop. The plan is to continue to grow. And yes, in most markets, we have about two reporters and some we have three if it's a bigger market um, and there's that need that's there. And it's the, the idea, you know, most of the time, these are reporters who might have been at their local newspaper, but they also could have been at a radio station or a television station. Um, but they are people who know their community very well. And they they bring in expertise to that newsletter. And they're, they're the main vehicle that is driving that content on a day to day basis. And you're in charge of local, which means yeah. you're skimming all 24 of these every day. You're having meetings on an individual. Level. Tell me what your day is like. How do you manage um, multiple cities of local content feeding a national brand. What is your day like? It, it is, it, it changes. Like every day is different um, because it is a very, it is very much a startup. So Jamie Stockwell is the executive editor and she came from the New York Times. Jamie and I have basically been trying to work together. Axios Local launched about a year and a half ago. And most of these cities were basically, you know, they, they, they've been cooking with bacon grease, right? All this time. And so Jamie and I have come in and we've tried to apply the expertise and the knowledge that we've had from our careers um, to provide a little bit more structure, um, to uh, sort of organize the cities a bit and to have a better um, a better way to sort of operate in terms of our workflow. Um, it is, it is, uh, it's a lot, <laughs> like, like, I'm not, <laughs> like it's a lot. And, and I think that every day is, um, it's different and I have to focus on a, an area. I have to trust a lot of people, right? I have to trust the people who are, are, are putting out these newsletters, but they have, they've been doing this for the past year and a half and they're really good at it. And that allows me to be able to concentrate on other things and to work with Jamie on like the larger strategy and what this is going to look like as we continue to, to stretch across the entire country. This also must add a whole new dimension to the Axios, um, I guess, news gathering operation, because you can have a story break in a local city that suddenly becomes big national news, correct? And it, it, it has. Right. And a lot of times uh, Jamie and I will have a conversation about what we're going to do and say, well, I know what I would have done if I was at CNN or if I was at AP. And she's like, I know what I would have done if I was at The Times or The Washington Post. So like, let's figure out what we need to do. And, and we have done that. We have had to respond to the shooting in Texas um, and trying to figure out, like, what is our lens and what's the appropriate lens for that? And having conversations about school safety and what's happening, you know, in local markets there. Um, we, we've also done this when the Dobbs decision came. Came down. We pushed out, um, you know, over over twenty um, thought bubbles, what we call thought bubbles, just to tell the cities, well, how is this decision going to affect you? And we had, you know, a little bit of a head start because of the leak, but we knew exactly like how to prepare for that situation. So every time something happens, it's an opportunity for us to sort of establish what our identity is going to be, what it is right now, and and maybe our approach for the future. I was. Um... I, my background's radio and TV, but I, I come from the old days. I used to be on AM Morning Man Disc Jockey. This is before people really watched the Today Show. You might remember the, the local anchor for the morning broadcast used to be the retired guy that no one cared about. And AM radio, we used to have full service. Where my, I actually was in small markets where I'd have a news guy, a sports guy, a weather guy, even a traffic guy. You paid four records an hour and all that. And, more. and I used to manage, I actually ran a radio group where I managed local news. And on radio, it was brevity, brevity, brevity. We were the ones being, you know, accused of if it bleeds, it leads. And I sat on a NAB panel once with a newspaper guy, from, I think from Pointer. I know you went to Pointer. This was years ago, who screamed at me that you have to feed the public the news they need to know. And you have to be more in depth. And he talked about the beauty of public broadcasting and how when you watched all, you know, the, the evening brought, you should be watching more PBS because they take a story and they go so far in depth into it. Then I look at the Axios model, which is rocking. Now you have 53% open rates on your emails. That's the yeah. average I read. At least it could have changed since what I read. And it goes from one big thing. What's next? Go deeper. Why it matters. I mean, you're almost to a point where you're the exact opposite of this in-depth world. What say you, you're now me back on that stage and some Pulitzer Prize winning guy yells at you, how dare you trivialize the important content that our society needs? What say you to that? Um, I just don't, I don't look at it that way. You know, like 
before, and I, and I am somebody, and, and I know that um, Jamie is is the same. Like we are and have been people who were in newsrooms, we're hard news, we're hard news journalists. That like, that is absolutely who we who we are. But um, who is to say that? our newsletter can't have an impact just because it's in brevity, right? Or we also have the option to go deeper and we can do a much longer or deeper story, a deeper dive. And Thomas Wheatley did that in Atlanta and he has affected change and, you know, covering like all, a multitude of things. Like we have right. climate <laughs> issues. I, I, so I just don't subscribe to that. Like, I think that that's like the, the sort of old school mentality. And I think we're past that. We have to like Look at we have to consider the 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 opportunity that is in front of us because everyone's attention span is actually changing, right? If I'm looking at even the TV market, that's also changing because my kids, I don't I don't even have cable and I haven't had cable in about 10 years. And so how are they going to consume news in the future? And that's the way that I look at it. How am I consuming news? Well, it makes a whole lot of sense to to have a mobile device and and it is working. So you're correct. Our open rates are between 30 and 55 percent in most of our cities. At this point, you know, Axios Local has generated five million dollars in revenue and we reached one million unique subscribers across 24 markets. And so that's and, and, and it should continue to pick up. Right. So if I'm looking at the future, it's like when we were talking about me working at television. We used to send people text notifications to deliver news. And then all of a sudden there was a news app. And I was like, well, this news app thing really seems cool. It gives you a little push down and that's how you get your news. I'm going to go all in on that. And I'm pushing all of the chips to the table and I'm going to abandon this text notification thing. And at the time, it wasn't a very popular decision, but I think it worked out. And I will say the same thing about Axios. Like if I thought about myself and the career and the decisions that I've made throughout my trajectory, most of the time you can watch the wave of news. And if you pay attention to history, you know that there's always some kind of a disruption. Like this isn't new. The radio disrupted newspapers, <laughs> like the like TV news, it disrupted newspapers and they thought that was the end. Axios doesn't spell the end for newspapers. We're just adjusting to what the current rhythm is in this market. And you adjust to it, you adapt to it, or you don't. And some people will make the decision not to. But, you know, that's where we are right now. We're at a point where the way that the people's people's habits are changing and we're adapting to that. And, you know, that's just kind of like the way that, that things are going to be now. Um, I was reading the Knight Foundation study of 2020. I don't know if you're familiar with it, where they were evaluating which way audiences were leaning left versus right, you know, the Fox far right, the MSNBC far left. You guys have managed to stay in the middle, which I find fascinating because you do not you do not give any credence to big lies, if I may use that term, and far right, uh, you know, conspiracy stories. But your original, this is fascinating because, you know, if you think about it, the Axios brand is all over MSNBC a lot. And that may be because you were originally funded by NBC News, one of your original you know, partners. I have no idea. But you also got money originally from Coke Industries, which I think is fascinating. So Axios, how do you stay in the middle? I have to ask you, sir. Here you are, a black journalist. Do you look at both sides of every equation? You know how polarized the society is now. We've you've heard the term echo chamber. You just said it yourself. CNN, Fox, MSNBC, they're all just preaching to their own choirs now. A lot of brainiacs say you guys manage to keep building audience and staying in the center politically. Is that a mission or is that just like doing good journalism or both? Um, I think it's 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 a little bit of both, right? Like. This is like our newsletters and local. Our, our mission is not to to delve into you know politics, but you know how does the how do the the policies and the decisions that are made maybe in D.C. how does that affect the you know inside outside the Beltway? Um, like, are we able to tell um, our our readers what is affecting them? And I think that every time that we apply our lens, that's the conversation. Like, what is happening in our schools? Um, if there's a conversation, uh, we're heading into the, the, new, the next school year, we're having conversations about critical race theory and what happened over the past you know, several months. We're talking about book bans. Well, we need to go back and look at that and look at the things that people are saying. We've had shootings in schools. And so what's gonna, what, what is security? Like, what we really try to tap into is what people are talking about. And if it does have um, politics, if politics comes into play, then we're not going to shy away from it because our reporters are able to do that as well. Um, but our mission is not quite the same. We, we often try to go where the readers are as opposed to being in a newsroom and making a decision based on what I think 
we should be doing. And I think that that's the biggest thing is like pushing that conversation to some of the people who are in the community that know it better and know it well. And then, you know, tapping the experts where we can, like we have people on the national team that can help us and we collaborate and we use our expertise and our outreach in local markets to try to help to add, you know, value to the stories and the work that they're trying to, that they're doing as well. And it's just a smarter approach as long as we're communicating. Um, but you know, we our, our our mission is not to to get into any kind of dog bites about like you know the things that are that are sort of these this is the business issues that you know that people are are constantly going through um, today. Well, I actually had a meeting with our editorial people recently, um, with my wife who runs it, and we were discussing moving more into a newsletter philosophy. In other words, what? It, it, okay, let me take you back in time because you're like me. You entered this industry. Um, and then became a nerd on the nerd side first. Remember, I was a digital leader at a legacy paper. So I was the new culture. They called it new media. Remember that term back then? We were new media. Um, remember how we used to word, we used the word portals. We thought everybody was going to start on our sites. That was the dark ages. Like I remember when I drove through Boston, the big dig, there was a big um, Boston.com, the only site in Boston not under construction, like someone would start their journey on their homepage. Then we got into search. Remember, everything was about SEO, SEO. Then it was social media. Everybody's going to start their journey with social media. Now it seems to be email. Don't you agree? Um my best open rates, my best ways of launching new products, my best ways of getting attention to a story or a program is email. Axios has started with that philosophy. It's almost like when you think Axios, I don't think you think of the website. You think of the newsletter, right? And Correct. and I think we're going to be moving. Do you think that is, it's not, the, it's not just the journalism, it's the media, right? I mean, give them the media that people want quickly. I, I think that, um, and this is just, I guess, my thoughts on it. You, you deliver the news where the people are. And if that is, you know, delivering a newspaper to their to their porch, then that's where that goes. If they're on the web, then, you know, you go there. If it's on an app, then that's where you should be. And if they're on the email, be smart enough to know, perhaps you should get on that email train too. And um, I think that, I don't know that that's what it's always going to be, but everything changes, right? right. When, I was, when, I, when I was young, like we had MySpace and I can't tell you where you know, MySpace is gone now, but Facebook has managed to stay, but st Facebook has been able to adapt and meta and has been able to adjust. And, and that's the thing, like you should be nimble and, and you should be willing to sort of try new things or explore new things. And that's really all that we're trying to do is, well, people are actually there, right? And I look at it and I, when I talk to my teams, I'd say, you know, our goal should be to try to educate people with their own, if they're on their phone. And if you just use your phone to hop into an Uber, then you have that phone out and you're reading um, Axios. The news that we have should appeal to the rider as much as it does the driver, because the driver could be doing it for business. It could just be a hobby. It could be a way for them to explore and learn their city. The person in the back seat could be a CEO, could be somebody who's just going to work, could just be somebody that's going out. Right. It's how we live, work and play. And these are the things that we try to hit on every single day. And the conversations that we have with our friends and with our family and our different communities, we want to reflect that in the newsletters. So the newsletter right now, that is the vehicle. But we do have a website. We just put a lot of our energy into the newsletters and we will eventually build the website to the point where like that's there too but that's just not that right now that's not the goal but the secret sauce is when i do a newsletter and we have you know fifty five thousand in ours the mission is to get it clicked the axios newsletter you don't have to click you get the story there and by the way kudos i don't i don't know if you talk to the advertising guys but everybody who's from the ad side like me should go to axios studio and explore how you lift brands so creatively without making it look obnoxious. You blend content and ads so creatively and do it, in my humble opinion, without damaging the brand, but you share the brand when the content is worthy. I mean, you gotta be proud of that sometimes. I know I'm, I'm feeding you the answer, but don't you agree when, you, when you're putting ads on your newsletters, they, they mean something and they have good, it's good content. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you know, it's like, you know, the, the days of the pop up, like that was it was kind of annoying. Right. Remember, I ran commercials on radio and TV. I mean, no one liked those either. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. Or the, it's um, I, I think if it's if it doesn't really bother you um, like, and, it's, it's, and it's unobtrusive, then it's a lot easier for you to digest. And it's also and it's quick. Right. So that it does. You don't want to slow it down with a whole bunch of ads like that. It's just not that's not going to be a pleasing experience for whoever that reader is.
more importantly, gives the advertiser the impact they need. Um, Delano Mace, uh, Massey, excuse me. Um, I didn't even mention this. The twenty, uh, you, you did the Kiplinger program, the Pointer NABJ Leadership Academy for Diversity and Digital Media, Maynard Institute's Media Academy at Harvard. Um, and in the fall of 2021, you were not, were you not recognized as one of the most influential people of African descent in the, in the media industry? So um, CNN's loss is Axios gain, if I may be so bold. And thank you so much. Uh, Axios Local, watch it come to your town. I guess we should say that, right? Because it's going to keep expanding. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. And I, I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and, and having me on. Like, I really enjoyed this. And, you know, I hope that we can continue having a conversation even offline. Thank you. You have a good day, sir. You too.